Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have such a wonderful audience. Um, I'm going to just dive right in because I have a lot, a lot to say tonight. Um, as you just heard, uh, a number of us have been, did my mics go? A number of us have uh, spent, spent the day uh, talking about issues of um, work-life balance. And we've had a really uh, engaging and interesting set of talks and conversations. I want to set that conversation into a couple of other contexts tonight. One is the larger economic context in which any debates at, about uh, work family policy or work life policy uh, are taking place on the one hand. And secondly, within the context of the planetary ecology, because that's a very important context for anything that we do uh, now in the 21st century. What I'm going to argue tonight is that we face a moment in our national life when what the climate discourse calls business as usual, and by this I mean business as usual policy, business as usual economic change is no longer feasible and we've really got to push through to something much more transformative and indeed more radical if we are going to hope to solve the problems of work family balance, unemployment and economic downturn and also the planetary emergency on the ecological front. Part of why we need something different is that the solutions to the first two, to sort of standard public policy issues on the one hand, and are we, oh, thanks, um, and unemployment on the other, uh, the, the typical solutions for those, and I'm, I'm going to say more about this in a minute, typically involve exacerbating the problems on the planetary side. And so far, the kinds of problem, uh, solutions that we have for the environment may well exacerbate um, unemployment and economic problems. And we've seen that divide. We've seen that conflict emerge already in conversations about climate. That's a big reason we need to push through, because we are in a time when these two are moving against each other, and yet we must solve both of them because they're both absolutely urgent. The vision that I'm going to set out for you today, which I call plenitude, I believe is a way to move forward which solves our unemployment problem, deals with work-family balance, and also is deeply regenerative and restorative for the Earth. And I suppose if there's one message that I want to both begin and I'll probably end with, it's that the things which help the earth also help people. And the things which help people help the earth. And that's very much contrary to the way our economy is organized today, the way economists tend to think about it, and the way we've structured things. So let me try and back that up. I'm going to start, are you going to be able to hear me if I move around? Yeah, okay, great. I'm going to start with some pictures of what has been happening in this country on the unemployment front. And the reason I start with them is that the national discourse has already moved away from the depth, the severity, and the profundity of the economic problem. We no longer have an urgency, we have a discourse which is moving away from solving unemployment and which somehow thinks that the economy is going to um, get better on its own, that a recovery has begun and so forth. And so I think if we take a look at how deep, how broad and how serious our unemployment crisis is, we're going to be in a better frame of mind for understanding why we need some pretty transformative change. So here we are in January of 2000. This is the peak of the previous economic expansion, the point at which unemployment is lowest. And you can see, for example, that in your part of the, let me find my laser pointer, yeah, in your part of the world here, 
Am I in the right one? Yes? <laughs> Terrible. I was just looking at it on the map. Um, we, we've got pretty low unemployment, and we heard from some HR people this uh, afternoon actually about issues of labor shortage and so forth. We are in a part of the country that's very different um, from many other parts of the country in terms of its unemployment. So what this graph shows, the, the yellow areas are 2 to 3 to 4 percent unemployment. As we go up, the darker the colors get, the more unemployment. The darkest color, the black, is 10 percent or more. Now remember, that's official unemployment. And the real unemployment rate, which measures the people who've given up looking, the involuntary part-timers and so forth, is somewhere between one and a half, maybe almost as much as two times greater than that. So the real unemployment rate is, is, is considerably higher. But in Jan of 2007, the official unemployment rate was 4.6. And then things started changing. We had the beginnings of the uh, housing collapse. Uh, actually, some of it had started the, the subprime mortgage collapse. And that began having impacts around the country. By July of 08, of, of 08, which was before Lehman Brothers uh, went bankrupt, before the financial panic of the fall of 2008, we see already certain parts of the country getting very dark here, 10 percent in some of these, the dark purple areas. Even within the middle of the country, we start to see some bad areas in terms of higher unemployment. By October of 2008, the uh, increases in unemployment were quite significant. And at that point, business panicked. Uh, some people would say they also laid off a lot of people. They, they wanted to lay off anyway, so they used the, the downturn as, a, as an excuse to restructure. And things started getting grimmer and grimmer and grimmer and grimmer, and grimmer. Notice, we're well into recovery here. <laughs> by, May, by May of 2010, we're in a recovery in which the unemployment rate is getting worse and worse. So now, that's the last data we have here. Notice how much of the country is in the 10 percent and over. Um, and as I said, the real unemployment rates there are considerably higher. This is a level of unemployment which is incredibly broad, incredibly deep, and will be very, very difficult to get out of. Now, what exactly is happening? Uh, by August, uh, and it's just the numbers are roughly the same now, we had for every available job in the country 4.8 people looking for a job. Almost five people looking for every available job. The unemployment and underemployment rate was almost 17 percent. We had uh, uh, almost 15 million people absolutely unemployed and measured as unemployed. But that number goes up to 26 million if we count people who are underemployed, that is, they have only part-time work but need full-time work, people who are have dropped out of the labor market, are discouraged, and so forth, or what we call marginally attached. Since the peak, the year I started with, uh, that or the month I started, that December 2007, we've lost 7.6 million jobs in this economy. And we need roughly uh, about almost 3.5 million more to be created because of labor force growth coming through mostly population growth. Because every month we have new entrants to the labor force. Many of you uh, college students will be uh, becoming those new entrants uh, this spring, next spring, etc. So we need to generate jobs just to keep up with the labor force growth as well as make up that eight, almost 8 million jobs. We did lose originally 8 million jobs. The economy is generating in the private sector only about 70,000 jobs a month. We need half a million, 500,000, to get us back to the pre-crash period over a period of two years. And that is way beyond anything we've seen and are likely to see. We are still experiencing job losses in this economy because state and local governments, of course, are laying off 
lots of people because of the repercussions here. So we have a very deep uh, problem when it comes to labor market imbalance. Uh, as I say, first year of recovery saw a net loss of jobs. Now, what about the future? What does it hold? And the, the model that we've used in many ways over recent, um, over the last recent decades, you know, three, four decades is let's trust the private sector, let these corporations do what they want, they're the wealth generators, let them generate the jobs, generate the wealth. It's a trickle-down model of job generation. So let's let the economy grow as rapidly as possible in order to generate these jobs. They'll trickle down uh, into the labor force. And number two, um, the corporate sector will generate a lot of wealth, and then we can get taxes to use that to solve social problems and so forth. That's been the basic model. If we think about what's coming down the pike in terms of the economy, there are reasons to doubt that we are going to be able to see that kind of a period again in, um, for a couple of reasons. One is, if you look over the long haul, um, since the end of the Second World War, roughly, to the profitability of the U.S. economy, this is the private economy, you see uh, two things. One is a long period of downturn. Now, with the ups and downs of the business cycle, profits always go up and down with the business cycle, but a long period in which profitability fell to a low um, just uh, by the end of the 1970s. There was a big recession in 1980, um, and after that, things turned around. Now, one of the things that happened was corporations went on a you know, pretty concerted effort to turn things in their favor because of these declining profits, uh, particularly in the 1970s, they said, wait a second, what's happening here? There are a lot of things that need to be done so we can get more profits. And the, the economic policies, which began to be instituted in the 1980s, uh, go under the name of neoliberalism, but you know, other names too, were pretty successful in raising those profit rates. And you see then a long period of rising profitability. But if you were to uh, look historically at the way profitability moves over long periods of time, particularly over roughly 50-year periods, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it goes down for 25 and goes up for 25, goes down for 25, goes up for 25. This is a long-term trend in many market economies over um, more than a century. And if that pattern, and economists don't really understand it all that well, if that pattern holds true, one of the things we're going to expect is declining profitability over the next period, because we've just had a roughly 30-year period of rising profitability. So long term, I think there's going to be a downturn in profits. It's, I think, would be foolhardy to see them as the goose that lays golden eggs that are, are going to solve our problems. Why? Uh, well, a number of other things are happening. Globalization, of course. A lot of the jobs which were lost here in this recession are not going to come back if they do in this country. These are jobs which are going to appear in other places because we are in a highly globalized economy. And we are one in which that preeminent position of the United States has been eroding relative to its competitors. That's just a normal process. But the benefits that Americans have gotten as a result of that will also erode. We've got a lot of labor displacing technical change going on. We have an incredible revolution in information technology that allows us to do enormous things with less and less labor. And so in industry after industry, not just in manufacturing but in the service sector as well, this technical change al allows us to displace labor. Historically, uh, one of the ways that labor has been reabsorbed has been through growth, and the other has been through working hours declines, which I'm going to come back to. The other important part of this, and I'm going to get to this a bit more in a minute, is environmental costs. We are going to have to start taking into account the environmental destruction that this all our production is doing. And when we do, when we price carbon properly, 
when we look at ecosystem functioning and natural capital and try and price it and put it into our accounting systems instead of having a crazy accounting system that when you have a big oil spill you have a g n p that goes up because you only count the costs of cleanup and you don't count what you've done to your ecosystems i mean that's like an insane accounting system when we move away from that um that's going to impose costs. Uh, one other reason is, of course, excuse me, that a lot of those profits were financial industry profits. And here's this you know, famous uh, statistic now that before the, uh, right before the crash, fully 40% of corporate profits in this country were going into finance. And what were they going to? They were going to those big fat bonuses and outsized compensation of those hedge fund managers and, and J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, of course, the people who were creating all that incredible systemic risk which brought our financial system and the whole global economy down. And that, of course, has got to change. Now, that's the economic context. It doesn't look that great for business as usual for all those reasons. Let me turn now to the ecological context. And I want to start with a measure that people are probably familiar with. It's called the ecological footprint. It's the measure of the land area and the shallow seawater that is necessary to support our level of production and consumption. And you can calculate this for a country. We calculate it for the world. You can calculate it for a city, a state, calculate it for a household. And I urge all of you who have not yet calculated your own personal ecological footprint or your family footprint to go and do so. It's a really illuminating exercise. Now, there, there is a certain amount of land and, and sea area available uh, on Earth, and we call this the biocapacity of Earth. It's the ability of the Earth's ecosystems to support our life, human life, production, and consumption. In 1961, which is our earliest year for the eco footprint, we were using about half of the Earth's biocapacity. The darker areas are higher levels of, of eco footprint. You see there were certain places, not where you live, by the way, but where I live, where we had really resource intensive lifestyles. Northern Europe was another, a few parts of India, China, and so forth. By 2001, look, the whole eastern half of the US is at a level, this red, this red, by the way, is above the sustainable level. So that's at about the two, uh, uh, two and a half um, hectares. That's a metric acre measure, uh, measure land measure. Um, the red areas are the unsustainable levels. Look at that, all of Europe there, a huge fraction of India, China, and so forth. And we were in what the uh, ecologists call overshoot, which is that we were using more of the Earth's biocapacity than is available. Well, how could that happen? It meant that we were running down the basic ecosystems of the Earth, the carbon system, the atmospheric system being the most important by putting much more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere than the system is capable of recycling safely, but also deforesting, um, uh, creating deserts in places which were uh, arable land before, uh, running down groundwater, and so forth. So we were eating into the Earth's basic support systems uh, on which uh, all life, not just human life, depends. And we are now at about 150% of biocapacity. Uh, each year, the global economic footprint gets higher. And um, ecolo excuse me, ecological footprint. An ecological footprint is the um, uh, basis of the well-known statistic that if everyone in the world were to live like Americans, we'd need five planets, because we have an eco footprint, which is about uh, five times the sustainable footprint if everyone on Earth um, were to have an equal share. Um, but it's not just eco footprint which is telling the story of ecological degradation. This is a measure of biodiversity, the living planet index. The black one is the uh, composite. But looking at three major types of species, land species, marine species, and freshwater species, there's been a collapse of biodiversity since 1970, a decline of about 
30 percent, we are creating a new mass extinction of species, according to biologists, because of the pressures that we're putting on ecosystems, on the climate, and so forth. Um, and I love this one. This is the uh, world consumption cartogram, which um, starts from an equal area map, and it says, well, how much is, uh, of each of these countries consuming? And what I especially like is the great big balloon consuming uh, of the United States. You see this area swollen. Um, and look at the shrunken consumption of places like the entire continent of Africa, whose consumption of resources is so small, um, uh, Latin America, and so forth. So we have outsized consumption in these so-called you know, original advanced countries or regions of the world, North America, uh, Europe, Japan, um, and taking up ecological space that is needed um, for many other regions of the world, and we can talk more about that. Of course, oil is a big uh, part of this and other fossil fuels, but the levels of oil consumption per capita in the U.S. and Canada uh, dwarf the rest of the world and are more than double uh, the rest of the industrialized world, and that's one of the big reasons our eco-footprint is so high. Getting to oil, of course, brings us to the biggest um, pressing ecological issue of our moment, and that is climate change. And the destabilization of the Earth's climate that is going on as a result of our use of fossil fuels. This is a uh, diagram of anomalous temperatures. Um, and what we see is that in recent years, we have a big increase in anomalously hot temperatures. This year, 2010, is on record to be, if things continue, will be the hottest year ever in human history. Um, in Los Angeles, about a month ago, the temperature hit 113. We are well into climate change and heating, global heating, which is a better term than global warming, global heating is only one of the many things that are happening. We had the fires in Russia, the floods in Pakistan, uh, Katrina, a variety of extreme weather events, the movement of species poleward, the spring coming earlier, uh, the winter coming later, freak things like the blooming of cherry blossoms um, in places like Boston in January. It's, we are destabilizing the Earth's climate. Climate change is not something that is going to happen to future generations. And the, the discourse, I think, has been really misleading on this. Climate change is something that has begun. We are well into it. And we are still largely in denial about it. And this is just a graph of the people who are already dying around the world because of climate change. The redder places are the higher levels. And one of the things that you see is that Africa, South Asia, Western Asia are places where we are already experiencing a lot of human um, suffering and death as a result of climate change. I think one of the most important things about climate change and one of the, the I think, most challenging things for this country is that we are the number one carbon legacy nation. That is, we are responsible for an outsized proportion of all the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. And yet, we are a country who will be far less affected in the short term than places like India, where my husband's family is from, which is unbearably hot already unbearably hot. Um, you know, West Asia, uh, Africa, where we're, where, where we're seeing incredible desertification, droughts, declining uh, yields, water shortages, and so forth. So the worst of a lot of this is going to be visited first on the people least responsible for it. But that disconnect between where a lot of the, the emissions are coming from and where where the, um, the costs 
are being born first is part of why it's been hard to mobilize around it. Um, a really important part of this is that when our economy grows, emissions grow. And if you see the periods of time when emissions fell, it was the little recession in 1990, it was the bursting of the dot-com bubble in 2000, and it was, of course, the big downturn. Look at the huge drop in emissions when the economy goes down. And this is that contradiction that I started with. When the economy grows, pollution increases because it comes from all that economic activity. And until we can switch to a clean energy system, which is going to take time, we've got to confront the fact that our solutions for unemployment, oh, let's just have a stimulus and grow the economy. Let's just get people to buy more stuff, more cars, build bigger houses, more construction, and so forth, which is all we've managed to come up with so far as a society for a solution is only going to make things much worse on a much bigger problem, which is climate destabilization. So we need to rethink. If you looked at the discourse that went on among economists, and I'll have like one little bash economist moment and then I'm gonna move on from it. After the, um, after the downturn, among the macroeconomists, because at the time the economy was collapsing, more and more really bad news on climate was coming out. This was the period leading up to Copenhagen, which was in February of 2009. And there was a lot of measurement going on, a lot of publicizing of what the scientists were finding. And each week brought grimmer and grimmer news, whether it's the melting of the Arctic, the uh, uh, desertification, uh, weather events, anomalous temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, species moving, all of those things. The econ it's, and we've got, you know, in some sense you can think the planets go, we're going off a cliff here in terms of climate. What were the economists talking about? How fast we could get to the cliff. They're talking about acceleration, acceleration. So it's a terrible disconnect that we have. We need to bring these two conversations together. What is our challenge? Well. We've got, we've got to get back to a place we've already passed, which is 350 parts per million in the atmosphere in terms of concentrations of greenhouse gases. We're at about 390 now. So it's a big job in a world in which all we have figured out how to do is grow as a way of giving people well-being. I think one of the really important things that we've been talking about here today and people we're going to be talking about tomorrow is how do you provide people well-being with a different mechanism, one which is not destroying our planet. And we can do it. There are lots of ways to do it, but we've got to get out of the mindset that we've got to stick with what we have. So we have a big task ahead of ourselves. We've got to get a 90% reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions by the year 250, 2050. Now, the conventional uh, wisdom is, oh, but we can continue to grow. It's okay. Growth is sacrosanct. We don't want to question that. Technology and the market will save us. And this is the conventional wisdom. It's believed by many people. And I'll say, first of all, tech, we need technology badly. We need to get off a fossil fuel energy system onto a clean energy system. We need new non-toxic uh, technologies. We need, closing, we need to close the loop. Uh, as nature does, in which we don't create these horrible wastes and pollutions, but we actually produce in the first place in clean, benign, organic ways. Um, but we can't keep growing while we do it. We did have some progress since 1980. We are decarbonizing at about 1.2, 1.5% a year. So that's progress. but. For every 1% or 1.5% of decarbonization that happens, we increase the economy by 1.5% or by 2%. So that over this period, even with technical change going on, the total amount of materials used in the global economy went up by almost 50%, by 45%. We can't keep increasing the scale of our enterprise at the level of technical progress that we have and that we can expect. 
for the next couple of decades. In the US, it's been even worse than on a world scale, which is amazing because we're so wealthy and technologically sophisticated. We should have dematerialized a lot more. Europe grew, uh, used, increased its materials use by only about 9% if you don't count imports. This doesn't count imports. We had 66% increase in our total materials use over that time. We have outsized material consumption. This is comparisons. Each of these little rucksacks is about 15 kilograms of resource consumption per person per day. And look at us in North America with 88 kilograms. So that's an enormous amount. Now, you don't see it all in your dorm room or your house. A lot of it is extracted at the point of production. Um, so it's waste materials and so forth that gets used there. Um, that little computer that we buy had a lot of materials use uh, behind it that you don't see at the final point. But the Earth feels it. Um, and again, in a global production system, those effects are not necessarily, um, they're, they're ill-distributed. Ill Here's another way of saying it. Our GDP keeps going up. Material intensity, that's the technological progress, is going down, but not enough to stop resource extraction from rising. So we haven't been, it hasn't been working that we can grow and dematerialize, or we can grow and reduce our eco-impact. We've got to do something else. So can we continue with a business as usual economy driven by fossil fuels, consumerism, rising inequality, and a hands-off attitude toward market outcomes? That is what we call a rhetorical question. <laughs> or do we need another way? So um, one more thing I want to say, and so then all the grim stuff is over, and it's going to get very positive, because there is a way. And it's a way, actually, that I argue is going to make us a lot better off um, than the way we've been living, which, in addition to destroying the planet, has also been very destructive of human well-being. Um, not only for some of the reasons I've talked about, unemployment, um, but also erosion of community, uh, well-being, and so forth. A group of scientists published a path-breaking paper in uh, about a year ago in Nature. It was a global team of ecologists from around the world, and they said, are there boundaries to the planet, to what humans uh, can do to planetary systems? And they defined nine different systems, and they said, we've got to stay within certain boundaries to maintain a safe operating space for the planet. And they used that term, safe operating space. And then they tried to measure. Now, they didn't have data for everything. But on three critical boundaries, they said, we've already exceeded the safe space. Climate is one. I've already talked about that. Um, biodiversity is another, you see here. And the third is nitrogen cycling. But we're also, we've got problems on ozone depletion. The oceans are acidifying at horrifying rates. Um, chemical pollution, not yet quantified. I mean, we've got, we've got a lot of really uh, global fresh water use. We know we're going to be facing terrible water shortages in part because of climate change, in part because of overuse. The exceeding of these boundaries, the, the sort of the baiting of the earth, the baiting of nature through the, the destabilizing of the climate system means that there's a lot of uncertainty ahead, that we're moving into a period in which we have unleashed forces that we really don't know what we're dealing with. I am not going to stand here and tell you what is going to happen. And anyone who does is you know, not being truthful. There are scenarios. We can spin them out. And the scientists are doing a lot of that. We just don't know. And in a situation like that, we need to be prudent. We need to be cautious. We need to start hunkering down and thinking about how do we ensure that our communities survive, that we have enough food, that we have enough water, that we have enough energy. We need to move to a different kind of economic model, not one which is so centralized that a few banks going down can bring the entire world into a collapse. And so the path I'm going to show you is one which emphasizes resilience, safety, and reskilling, learning how to 
uh, interact with the material world in ways that will allow us at a more local and regional level to actually meet our needs. So the challenges ahead are to drastically reduce eco-impact in a short period of time, solve the unemployment crisis, be fair, improve the distributions of assets and income, and I didn't talk much about that, but these have gotten skewed beyond uh, belief over the last couple of decades, create true wealth and well-being, um, and avoid top-down inefficient or elitist solutions. That is, do this in a way that meets people's needs, create a politics, and I call it plenitude. Now, what are the key functions of it? Some I've talked about, the green tech. We need to shift to a different system. We're going to need new forms of ecological knowledge. But let me get to the ones that I want to focus on now in my remaining time. Reduce hours in jobs, and these are what I call business as usual jobs. Build people's time wealth, not just their financial wealth. Create a growing sector of small scale enterprises that are green, that are restoring the earth, not destroying them. Create new, more sustainable property forms. Invest in social capital, common property and communities. Revamp the consumer sector. Greening the current economy with its distributions of income, with its property structures, with its emphasis on the market above all, will not work. This is the system that has gotten us into this problem in the first place. We need to think about something pretty different. Now, to get back to unemployment, this is a graph of what happened to working hours over the period 1870 to 1973. And you have one of the nation's experts on working hours here, Professor Honeycutt. Um, and I'm sure many of you are taking classes with him. And you know he's done fantastic work on this topic. What you see is something really important. The average uh, work year went from about 3,000 hours, which is 60 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, down to uh, about 1,800 in that, in that 100 years. Two things were happening. One is these economies were growing, and that's part of how they reabsorbed labor. There was incredible technical change going on over this period, lots and lots of labor displacing technical change of the type that I talked about earlier. But growth didn't do it alone. This is really important. A, a big way that people got reabsorbed and how we were able to have high employment societies with the growing middle class and so forth is that working hours fell. And those two things together created prosperity. Now, if you look at what happened since 1973, there's been in the United States, a great flattening out here. And this is data from companies, which actually overstates what's, uh, or understates what's going on, depending on whether you're talking about work or leisure. Other countries in Europe kept going down. And of course, we know there's a big hours gap between the US and European countries, between two and 400 hours, depending on which country we're talking about. But look at what happened from the point of view of individuals, not from the firms, because people are taking on two jobs or three jobs. So the data from the individual side shows not only did, did people not get more leisure as they had for 100 years, but the average person began working more, and it, the, the average person who was working began working more and more hours. And this is, you know, I wrote the book Overworked American about this, but beginning in the 1970s, more and more hours. Now that does something um, very important, which is it makes it a lot harder to balance the labor market. If we want to get back to labor market equilibrium, to get jobs, to make jobs for all of you who are coming out of college, one of the things we're going to have to do is share the work that we have. We are going to have to be equitable about hours of work. Um, and the discourse on uh, inequality, which is mostly just about income, has to expand to also talk about work. Well, the other thing that this will do, it'll put people back to work. If, people, if we start hiring on 80% schedules, and we start uh, reducing hours, and we start giving people the opportunity to trade money for time, and there are a lot of different things we can do is it's going to have a huge impact in terms of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. What we're doing right now, we've got fixed or rising hours of work so that when we have productivity growth, it, excuse me, it creates more output, more consumption, more ecological impact, 
and the technological approach, which is the one we've been, all we've been using all this time, comes at the end here, and it's really hard. You can reduce ecological impact if you take productivity growth, put it into shorter hours of work, and I should have some, whoop, I lost my animation, sorry. Reduced hours of growth and lower ecological impact. And that's, uh, that's where work time reduction actually is so key, not just for work-life balance, which it is, but also for planetary balance. If you look across countries, you see that the countries which have lower working hours have lower ecological footprints, and the higher the work hours, the higher the footprint. And this is also true controlling for a variety of variables. So shorter work time policies. Many of the European countries, excuse the typo, did much better after the 2008 crash. Germany, for example, had virtually no increase in unemployment, despite the fact that they had a huge decline in output, just like we did. Why? because they adjusted their hours of work. People went off, went off overtime. The government compensated people for some of the lost hours um, through their unemployment insurance system. And that's something that we are beginning to see a little more of now. 17 states allow that. A company, can, instead of laying workers off in a downturn, can give everybody short hours. They can get some of that, that money made up through the unemployment system. Two, excuse me, two states have passed laws on this, five more in process. It's an interesting nonpartisan politics to this. These uh, reforms of the unemployment insurance are supported by business as well as labor. We need more time versus money options. The right, we need a right to work movement in this country, but it's a right to work less, which we don't have. Tax incentives for short-term hiring, new employees at 80%. I lived in the Netherlands for two years in the mid-90s. They had a big increase in unemployment at the beginning of the 80s, like what we've had now, a really serious one. They put all new government employees on 80%. The whole financial sector went to 80% time. That's a four-day work week, by the way. It sounds a lot better when you say it that way, doesn't it? Four-day work week, rather, 80% time. Um, they had no unemployment by the time I got there in the mid-90s, and they had the highest productivity in Europe. Shorter hours of work are associated with higher productivity, which means it's a wealth-creating, efficient way to organize a labor market. Um, I want to talk about one more thing before I end, and that's what do we do with that time. Professor Honeycutt studied um, the Kellogg workers who went, uh, had big reductions in their hours of work, and many of the men had trouble uh, with those short hours, and they were bored, and we know that one of the things that you know, is happening in our country today is people are just spending a lot of time watching TV or on the internet or Facebook and kind of ways that are not necessarily giving them a lot of well-being. If we do manage to get reductions in working hours, which free up time, and which people put people on a path at, at which their incomes are not necessarily going up by all that much, and I should say, you know, there are a lot of people in this country who haven't seen increases in, in their incomes over decades. It's really just the top 20% who have gotten much in the way of increases, particularly since uh, the impacts of the downturn. But if we are able to move forward in a way that takes our productivity growth and gives us more free time, one of the things that people are going to want to do is get access to, to, to goods and services in other ways because their cash incomes are not going to be rising in the way that they would have been in this system, at least under ideal circumstances. So what can they do? There's a whole new thriving movement of people who are working shorter hours, but they're taking that extra time and they're getting really creative with it. Now, the people you've heard most about are the ones who are creative on the internet. So they're the people who are creating YouTube videos. They're doing software coding to make Linux, or they're the ones who made Wikipedia what it is. They're doing this stuff not for money. They're doing it for love of the activity, for professional recognition, for a variety of motivations, but not to earn. They're doing it because they love to. Where are companies getting their advertisements from these days? The donated labor of all of us, right? Because there are a lot of people out there making ads for the big companies and their contests and so on and so forth. 
That's happening online in a really big way. You can call it, the, the word I use here is self-providing. People making and doing things for themselves or self-provisioning. It's also something we can do offline. We can make food. We can make housing. We can create our own energy. And there's a thriving movement in which hours which are released from the business as usual economy get deployed to self-providing and green entrepreneurship. And this is part of how we build a new green economy that has low impact, has high resilience, allows us to actually be self-sufficient in our local and regional areas. So if the food system crashes, the fact that the supermarkets will run out in a week or two is not going to be so bad because we actually have relearned how to do some of these things for ourselves. Um, so what are people doing? They're doing permaculture and urban agriculture. They're growing chickens, uh, whole, having chickens. They don't grow them. They're you know, raising chickens in their backyard and trading their eggs. They're going to farmers markets. They're generating energy off the grid and in small scale ways. There's a whole movement of DIY home building. This is in the Southwest where they use Adobe. Where I live, we make yurts and wood and it's cheap. You don't need a big expensive mortgage. Often you do it with your friends who use natural materials from the region you live in at low cost. And there's some incredibly beautiful homes which are being built in these eco-friendly, low impact, low cost ways. There's a whole fabrication technology movement of small scale machines that are computer run that actually allow us to make all kinds of things, mostly with scrap metals and plastics. And it's called Fab Lab Technologies. Um, it came out of industry's need for prototypes, you know, making one or two things. They're fantastic machines. You can make bicycle frames with them. You can make toasters. You can make a cell phone. You can make uh, prefab houses with Fab Labs. And they're starting to spread. We also uh, are seeing more and more social innovation and consumption. When people have less money and more time, they start sharing. They start bartering. They start reselling. There's an explosion of all this sharing activity. It's not only giving people access to goods really cheaply. So if you buy something used, it's a lot less than if you buy it new. But it's also creating community and economic interdependence in a world in which people are craving that. So there's resale. There's barter. There's gift economies. They're making soup together. They're sharing cars. They're couch surfing. You name it across the board, a huge flowering of social innovation. This is my vision of how we move from a destructive, ecologically uh, out of balance and, and humanly out of balance business as usual economy. We start moving out, creating these uh, new enterprises, whether it's uh, clean transport or energy, building, growing. And then we uh, knitting. We don't want to forget the old-fashioned arts. And then we start trading among ourselves. And eventually, we have plenitude emerging. Thank you.